experiment in format but uh, Emily and I just recorded a segment that you people on YouTube and on the public side are not going to hear this will go on the um, patron side the private side of us sharing information with people and so this is the public side of it and we're recording this on um, Tuesday August 15th so we're in the um, we're in the prequinox right now. <laughs> We're ramping up to this. It's this, the preclips. The preclips. The preclips. Yeah, yeah. Why did I say equinox? Yeah, it's the preclips. But it's been like this weird. We've actually been in a month of major energetic, psychological, metabolic, systolic attacks on us and when i say attacks i mean targeted in a way that is very specific to what we're doing and uh all of this comes into play with this with this eclipse that's coming in the, the black hole sun eclipse um hold on a second The thing that we've all been seeing lately is, is kind of this, this whole AI thing, which on the first segment, Emily, you brought up Howard Ka ha Harold Kautzfella, which is kind of a, you know, that's now become kind of a classic case study on the public side for people of watching somebody that kind of flipped. In fact, you know, I was almost clueless about this when I interviewed Harold. It was later when I started to notice how this all began to play out of how researchers and people who are active in a field wind up being taken over by the very thing that they're warning about, which then means, do we have to be careful too? Because aren't we kind of warning about this and how, how subjective, how subjected to this are we in terms of the allure of this whole information spectrum that we engage in, that we are, we're generating energy into. And it's kind of a concern that I have. Yeah. And quite honestly, um, there's an energetic scale to this. It's very frightening right now because of what we're seeing in terms of certain people that are flipping and people who have kind of, let's just say, gone off the rails, the cheese is slid off the cracker, however you want to put that, but they're just, they're just, you know, they've lost it. They've the lost it. Went off the cracker. And, then, and they lost the narrative oh. as well. You know, the, the, we're seeing because of social media, and we've talked about this before, Emily, we are plugging our nervous system into devices that are energetically and psychically attached to other human beings. However that works. I mean, I said this 10 years ago. I used to get emails and I could read the energetic signature on an email and I used to go, mm -hmm. how's that possible? But it almost became unfailing after a while that when I paid attention to the energetic signature, I then was able to parse through a lot of this, which even then were, were, were attacks spiritual attacks, psychic attacks. And with email, at least you have the opportunity to filter things. What happens now is you're not drinking from a hose anymore, you're drinking from a fire hydrant mm -hmm. in terms of the ton of information and energetic impressions that are flowing through social media, specifically Facebook, and then off-ramp off a little bit, YouTube, because YouTube 
is this conduit for our content right now, which is going to change, where we have to interact with a whole other sector of the social structure that's it's like it's like Skid Row. I mean, basically you go off Facebook, which you somewhat control, and, and you're on YouTube where you cannot control much of anything unless you just turn the comments off. And now you've got Troll City out there. Uh, plus the fact that you have um, a tremendous amount of management going on on content and throttling of, of hit numbers and all kinds of chicanery going on in that spectrum. But let me go back to this for a minute. We've plugged into a neurological network whereby we are interfacing with people at very rapid speeds now. Um, most people partake of Facebook on an ongoing basis throughout their day. Some people look at it once a day, but what you're doing is you're scrolling down a page and I scan things. I, I don't look and read everything, but I see things. And eventually what happens is you get pulled into something. And usually what happens then is it becomes kind of this energetic engagement with concepts and ideas. All of this is fine, except we have lost control of our ability to control the vector that we're operating in because of the fact that on a certain level, and you're seeing this now, Emily, with, you know, the level of engagement you have versus what you had previously. Mine is on steroids because of the number of people that flooded in on my Facebook as a result of what happened in April and the whole post over the, the, the Blue Avians, Corey Good, David Wilcock thing being completely blown out of the water. You know, you talk about a curse, that was a curse. So as a result of that, um, I have a lot more traffic now and I have to deal with a lot more people. But even within that, what we're seeing now within this community, and that's what, that's what Shane the Ruiner, he calls this our community. And Shane feels very strongly, this is a community, better and worse, and that the people that we align with, people we, even people we've had on the show, are part of the community. And yet at the same time, they represent on some level, at some point, certain parties represent a risk in security and personal safety because of the vector they become in terms of this AI virus that's now completely open. And so what we're seeing is that there's, there's a robotic aspect to this in terms of the medium itself, which then morphs into this weird process. I'm trying to do this without naming names because I'd really rather not do that. Um, but what we're seeing now is that people's personalities are flipping. And we're seeing that um, they're becoming increasingly hostile. They're becoming aggressive. They are putting out information at a rate that no one can consume. And this is, this is probably the biggest danger that I see right now is the rapidity of data that we're turning over. It makes it nearly impossible to have discernment because our discernment operates on a harmonic level that allows us to process things at a human scale. And the machine, both the machine in front of your eyes and the machine behind the scenes, the machine messiah that everybody is now beginning to bow down to is, is doing throughput at such a rapid pace that we no longer can do that. And so we speed up. And, and I, said this, I said this years ago that we were never meant to process data at the rates that computers deliver them. We're dealing with machines operating at speeds in gigahertz. We're dealing with speeds that are in nanoseconds. We're dealing with bits and bytes and digitized graphics that are increasingly more granular and capable of rendering at higher resolution. So all of this is data that's flowing before your eyes 
And then you add to that the multimedia component, what we're doing, the podcasts, the videos. And the rapidity of information coming at us now is so, so quick that we no longer are able to process, process on a human scale, on an emotional scale, and it is bypassing what would be our normal ability to operate in discernment and judgment. And by judgment, I mean the ability to stop and say, whoa, wait a minute, let's park it right there. Let's stop and take a look at that. And so the delivery method itself is enabling us to be bypassed. Our filters are being bypassed. And we're, we're, we're now assimilating this information unfiltered, which is entering our subconscious and it is in code. We are literally also, processing binary now. Also, and uh, that was a really great, amazing breakdown and description. The other thing is, as we're not being able to filter stuff, things are being, they have algorithms that are targeting things at us. So as they, you know, as we become smarter and our discernment rises, the uh, technology it also figures out ways to send things at us that are more refined and more to our liking. And since we don't have, you know, time to filter through things so quickly, and a lot of us are really busy and we, you know, yeah, everyone likes to see something that they like or something that's appealing or, or whatever. Um, things, you know, um, stuff's getting really high end. Stuff's getting really um, fine tuned and specific and, um, uh, it, created for people who are like us, who are connoisseurs of information. It used to just be, things used to be really crude. And there's still a lot of crude shit put out there for the masses. But for those of us who have refined our taste, they've also refined the way that they target our taste. And um, they're coming up with very fancy little appetizers for those of us who like to dine and find, find in fancy restaurants, to use yeah. a sort of yeah. metaphor for here. Um, and um, you know, it's almost impossible to keep up, you know, with everything and to have your guard up all the time. And it's not a natural or normal or healthy way for a human to live, to have to have all their guards up and all their filters up all the time. Um, and I, you know, Facebook is the biggest vector for this YouTube also, but there's something YouTube while it's the wild west in terms of comments and shit, like Randy was saying, it doesn't interact with art nervous system the same way that Facebook does. Like Facebook gives you a level of anxiety about, are people liking my shit? Should I like this? Should I like that? Like sure. how many views do I, I mean, I don't, I'm not that, I don't care that much. Like I don't have, fortunately for me, I was never really into Facebook at all. Like sometimes I would go months without looking at it. And then obviously when I began doing the show, I started interacting with people more, which they're, it's great. I, I love interacting with people and I've gotten to have some really cool conversations with people both on Facebook and then we've moved them over to actual real chats and whatever. Um, but I've been more engaged in it since I started doing the show, but I just, I'm so busy. I don't have time to sit on Facebook that much. So it limits how, how engaged I can be and how much I care about it. Um, but I have had enough exposure to it now to understand how, how, how it works and what it does to one's nervous system. And when your nervous system becomes responsive to something, it also affects how your endocrine system, uh, functions. And, uh, Randy had a great quote in our last show about how we are in a war on our nervous system. And I, I meant to say after that, but we got, the conversation went somewhere else. Even more than that, we're in a war on our endocrine system. All the shit that's in the food, that's in the air, that's in everything is meant to damage our endocrine system. And we have to work to control our endocrine system. And it is completely, completely related to the nervous system. So once your nervous system is out of whack, your glands start not working as well. And that includes your third eye, that includes your you know, thyroid, your hypothalamus. All of these things are really, really important to our ability to be able to perceive reality correctly and to feel um, right inside of our own bodies. And the goal is to have us be outside of ourselves all the time, have us not be anchored firmly within our body, and have us not feel good in our body. And so um, the way Facebook works, the way like, you interact with it, not only are you interacting with the people that are behind that on the other side, but it's the Facebook is the vector and the interface and whatnot. Our um, 
our systems are becoming tuned to that. And I'm sure I'm not the only one that's ever had the Facebook screen show up in dreams or um, visions or whatever. And that's not good. And, you know, in fact, I, you know, maybe I've, you know, I even discovered a way that Facebook, aside from the way that we all understand that it's being used to uh, mind control and program us socially, it's also actually being used as a direct trigger for people, for, my, for you know, mind control victims. I had an experience with that that was quite fascinating. Um, I don't know if you recall, Randy, I told you about that. Maybe I should share that with people. I haven't shared that with people on the show before. Um, should I share that? Absolutely. Okay, so a few months back, um, I was, you know, you know when you're sort of just falling into sleep and um, I, uh, I, I was just falling to sleep. I couldn't have been asleep for more than a few minutes and whatever was behind my eyes or I don't know, if, uh, going into dream, it was the Facebook screen, but it was, um, rever it was black instead of, instead of white. So it was black. Um, and then you know how over on your Facebook, so in fact, you know, I, I'm on a screen share right now so people can see what I'm talking about. Um, you know how on your Facebook screen you have this? Let me show people. Uh, let's see, let's go right here and share the screen. So over, oh, of course the camera part is in that. Over here, I don't know if anyone, if people can see, can you see my, my cursor, Randy? Yeah, I can. Yep. Okay, over here where you can see like, okay, my friend Leo likes Libby, the GSD's video. <clears throat> okay, so I was seeing that over there and um, my, my attention was directed over there for some reason. And where the avatar is right here, there was a rabbit. And it looks like the rabbit from like Alice in Wonderland or like the white rabbit kind of thing, right? And for some, I was seeing it out of the corner of my eye. And what happened, I couldn't help it. Like there was a part of me that was like, don't look, but I couldn't help it, I had to look at it. And as soon as my eyes locked on it, what happened was the rabbit like pulled back into the distance. And then over here where there would normally be words, <clears throat> the sacred geometry symbol known as the seed of life, um, maybe we can pull that up. Say, maybe we can, let's see if I can pull up a picture of the seed of life. Um, this, so that symbol, the seed of life, came, uh, let's, see, let's see if I can pull that up and show people. While you're pulling that up, let me explain that Facebook web pages are laid out in a very logical way. At least for Western audiences, the right hand side is sacred material. You know, that's the part of the page where they put the advertising because the eyes will naturally travel there for those of us who okay. read from left to right. It was like this. I can't, I can't remember right now if it was black with white or white with black. So it was either that or like this, but there was a circle around it. So it was within a sit. I don't know why it's doing that. Why did it do that? Why is it doing that? I don't know what's going on there. Okay, but so it was the seed of life and I'm gonna end screen sharing right now because it's hard for me to concentrate when I'm looking at that. Okay, so it was in that area over there, the rabbit went away, there was a seed of life and the seed of life inside the sigil started spinning around, okay? Started spinning around and traveling backwards. And I realized that I was coming out of my body as I looked at this. And I immediately caught on this, I don't, I was being taken out of my body. I don't know if it was like for a trip to the cloning centers or just for some kind of, I don't know what was going on, but I immediately said, realized what was happening and I said, no, 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 I don't wanna go, I don't wanna go. And I was back in my body and awake. And I was up all night after that. I couldn't go back to sleep. I was like, wow, that is, so there was, th that was a very sophisticated, you know how people think about the old MK triggers would be like, okay, the phone would ring, it would have like a series of beeps or a series yeah, of yeah. words go off on their mission. Or like the shooter would see the woman in the red dress who said this and then he would do his thing, right? But think about, this was pretty sophisticated. So it's, Facebook screen and then off to the right and then the avatar and then the avatar moves and then the symbol comes and the symbol starts to spin and then as the symbol recedes that so there was like five or six or seven things there it's a pretty sophisticated series of triggers that got was was working on me um and I was like wow that's fascinating and I share, shared it with a few other people you know who I consider their opinions on um things related to these kinds of topics to their you know uh to be very good and helpful, and they, they thought that was extremely interesting and that I had caught something there. Um, so Facebook is being used in that way we all know it's being used, but for those of us, and I'm, you know, 
there's a lot more of us than people think. For those of us who've been through something else, it's also being used in another way to do something more sinister than just get us to be worried about what people are thinking about us on Facebook or what we're talking about on well, Facebook. Or to sell us products or to, you know, do all the normal right. commercial that, that's things. That's all. We all know about that stuff. This is something completely different. It's yeah. being used because they know that it's something that we will recognize. And so it's, they can use it just like, you know, they used uh, toys and tunes and things like that when you were little. Uh, Facebook is not a joke. You know what I mean? It's not a joke and it's not something that sprung up organically. This is something that was created by intelligence agencies and they don't just create things for one reason. There's always multi, multiple layers and levels why they do everything. Um, and so I just, you know, I thought, okay, so I just wanted to share that with you guys. I didn't even know we were going to be well, exactly. Well, a lot talking. of this was already field tested anyway because a lot of this, what you're seeing now with Facebook <clears throat> was actually an off, offshoot of early forums. And a lot of people who were on the early forums, and there were a bunch of them, and some of them were very, very specific forums where a lot of targeting and a lot of harvesting was going on, mm -hmm. tell stories about being triggered through imagery that was flashed on the screen. Yep. In other words, they understood real well early on they didn't have the wide population that Facebook has, but believe me, we are identified on Facebook because of what we talk about, because mm -hmm. of who we are, and the level of algorithm that now identifies you down to wherever you are in terms of, of, of geotracking. So they have the ability to know who you are. In likelihood, they profile knowing, knowing what your triggers are. Then you're taking your social profile. They can create such a specific algorithm mm -hmm. that essentially any, anything can be <clears throat> planted as a trigger. Yeah. Yep. Um, well, so. so it's kind of, you know, it is, it is dangerous. It's very dangerous for people who are dealing with coming out of programming, especially. That's why I think in a lot of ways, it's very smart for people who are either highly triggered or susceptible to triggering to not be on Facebook, which a number of our friends have now, said, Alisa, you know, we're just not Alisa, there. Alisa, yeah. Alisa's not on Facebook and while it would probably benefit her ability to get her story out tremendously she recognizes that it's not it's not worth the risk and um i have major respect for her for that you know she's like i'm just not even playing that game well it's the place that we're going to get to because i i yeah i'm coming to this as much as i enjoy the interaction and i do enjoy the inter and it scares me how much i enjoy the interaction by the way mm -hmm. because part of what i do is i'm a provocateur and Facebook is the perfect. Randy's the metaphysical Milo. <laughs> Facebook is the perfect place for, for for provocateurs. Yeah. It allows you to put things out in a in a, a very nuggetized, chunky kind of way that you can just lob stuff out there real quick, and you will get nearly instantaneous feedback. That's a tremendous rush for a personality like me. I, I'm being I'm being as transparent as I can. Yeah, you guys, it's like sometimes I'll leave for work in the morning and everything is peaceful. And I'll come back and like, I, what's going on? There's this huge shit storm that Randy has created on Facebook and like a whole other like universe has like formed off of no, the we're post. Up to it. We've literally <laughs> poked membranes through another universe. We've drained <laughs> the ocean on one continent and emptied it into the bathtub of another. And, and, and the, uh, the entire septic system has leaked into the, the whole process. But now, I will say, this, Randy, you are a provocateur, but like, you know, I would, like, you're like a, a special kind. Like some of the things that you, and even some of the things you fall into that you don't mean to and that you can some ways regret later, there does seem to develop around them a conversation and a dialogue that needs to be had. Um, and so, you know, I, I'm not usually much for provocateurs, but well, there, I have a special place well, in my heart. Are th for you. There are thoughtful people around <laughs> yeah. us, and I'm grateful for that because those those are the people we're trying to reach. Yeah, we're, we're you know, can I go out there and grab the unwashed? No, I can't. 
But that was the foolishness of trying to do religions. Religions try to do that. They go out into the streets and try to convert the drunk, the heroin addict, the prostitute. Yeah. It doesn't work. But finding people who are hungry for the kind of things that we do is, 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 is something that this was actually a media that I think for a time was ripe for the picking. But I also see how now it's, it's, it's rotting on the vine and how eventually, you know, if I stay here, if I stay on Facebook, if I continue to do this, I'm opening myself up for what we've already gotten a taste of already, which is essentially to be energetically and psychically attacked by AI constructs. Yep. Yeah. AI constructs yeah. hosted by human hosts. Yep who in a lot of cases do not realize how they're functioning as the vector for these AI bots. Yeah, we've, I mean, we've both been subject to that and I'm sure many of you out there have as well. Um, yeah, you know, and um, a lot of the experiences we've had for a long time, but certainly recently are really motivating Randy and I to um, sort of create our own space and our own platform away from Facebook and away from YouTube. Not that they won't in any way be we won't, not that we won't use them in some small ways, but we would like to create um, a safe, a safe space. Safe space, safe room. Safe, the safe space, you know, because we know a lot of people in our community um, want to be able to talk about really serious things. And there's a lot of people in our community that are suffering and need a safe place to talk about stuff. Um, and we need to have that and not be subject to all of this other fuckery. Um, and so that's something, you know, uh, that you will start to see us moving more and more towards in the next period of time here. In fact, in the next few weeks, we'll have an announcement about what's coming next for, um, for off planet yeah, radio. We've been pre-announcing this for months now. Uh, yes. Months. But Look, there's a, there's a creative process that goes into it and there's energy. And it's the fact that, that both of us wind up in a place where we have very limited time to put into a project. And that's especially been especially true with Emily of late. And then there's the added things that happen in terms of personal dynamics, energy dynamics, jobs. Um, we're people and we're trying to produce while at the same time maintaining our lives. You know, th this, this is a very difficult thing to do to make the transition, but the transition itself will enable us to actually open up and do more of what we're trying to do now because I, yeah. I i see how there is a an exchange that occurs as you begin to move into a place and I'm, we're not talking about commerce here i mean there is an exchange of values that goes into this and part of it obviously is a monetary exchange but it's very nominal and because it enables us to move into media that's no longer we don't have to duck and dodge the content police, the trolls. We don't have to feel vulnerable and exposed. There are conversations that we have that cannot be put into a public forum like YouTube or Facebook. They just can't be there. Randy and I have content that we've created that we yes. haven't released because it's not safe to release it. It's not safe uh, to release it because of who yeah. we are and what we are. And, 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 you know, and there's many of you that we would like to share it with. And so we're trying to work towards a platform that will enable us to share it safely, both safely for us and safely for you guys. Um, and, uh, and also we want to be, begin to be able to um, interact more with all of you. Um, we have some amazing people in our circle, like an, we an do. amazing yeah that we really love and appreciate and would like to be able to and some of them we would love to have interact even on the show and be able to maintain their privacy if that's what they what they choose but we have you know i think we have some listeners that know more than way more than we do and that we can learn from and we want to be able to have um conversations and and deeper exchanges with them than just a hundred and you know than just a paragraph on or you know small comments on facebook or or whatnot and um you know, so um, we want to we want to create something really that is you know special and interesting and different than something else out there, and that is 
creative and informative and helpful and and is about all of us working on these working on this together not just about everybody listening just to us talk about it <laughs> you know <laughs> You know, so uh, although we do appreciate that you listen to us talk about it. <laughs> um, yeah, we do. And we appreciate the interaction that we get from people in the social media as well. So yeah. uh, kind of where we started off with this was to go into the AI thing, but yeah. it kind of pivoted off of the conversation that you and I had on the undisclosed section of the page that had to do with the aspects of the more organic side of AI. So let me share screen here for a minute and <clears throat> maybe this will kind of take us into a place where um, this is still clunky doing screen shares. So here we go. What this is, this is what I shared on Facebook this morning, connected to a post that was made about, was yeah. made by our friend Rock Astaldo yeah. yesterday, based on the conversations that we've been having back and forth in the background, as well as the uh, show that we did with Ra and uh, Lada. Lada Leon. And this AI insectoid infection that Ra is talking about is really kind of the same thing that we're talking about on another level. It's what Emily's talking about in terms of things like the Mor Morgellons and the Candida and, and the, the connections sugar. to sugar as programmable matter, and then the Kombucha and all the other stuff. But anybody that wants to, this jumped into my head this morning. This movie I have not watched since 1987, but I remember this movie. It's Jeff Goldblum. I can't remember if I ever Fly. saw it. Well, what's creepy about it is that at one point in the movie, they're very, I mean, the the movie is really graphic because he's changing in and out. He's, he's shape-shifting. He's, yeah. he's an ectomorph. And that's, that's an ectomorph? Yeah, an ecto. He's a metamorphic fly. So, but it goes into this whole sugar aspect. And this is what triggered it. I kept going back in my memory going, I remember this, I remember this from a film what's the film and then it was the fly and I, I couldn't remember who starred in it. I couldn't remember if it was Richard Gere or William Hurt, but it's Jeff Goldblum. Of course, yeah. it's a creepy film. Yeah. He's a creepy guy. Totally. And he, this he, film- he looks, he looks like a bug. Boom. Goes into exotic technology. Um, in a way that now doesn't seem so strange given the things we've talked about on the show. Yeah. When you're talking about jump rooms and time travel and the type of dark project energy beams and wave to matter transfers, this movie doesn't feel so strange anymore. And basically it does at one point it goes into and it shows me it's just massively consuming sugar all over the place which is typical of a fly. And don't forget too that, that glucose fuels brain function. It hyper fuels brain function, by the way. This is why you feed small children tons of sugar, and then you need to give them Ritalin to control a disease that doesn't exist called ADHD. You know, I just have to say something really fast because I'm just noticing this and let's put a pin in it and get back to this another time. David Cronenberg made this movie. He also made the movie Videodrome with Deborah Harry, which is also something that's been coming up a lot lately. She's been coming up a lot in a lot of ways for me. Um, yeah. So, sorry. so we need to get back to that, but I just, I just noticed that. And Okay, so let's, yeah. No, Cronenberg was, he was kind of like uh, one of those really edgy producers back in the 80s that, that yep. made a lot of these kind of movies. And uh, look, these guys are very plugged into the intelligence community. I have very little yep. doubt that in 1987, what they were writing into this film was then kind of what the Matrix technology was to the current generation of film watchers, you know, the people who would have been watching movies and coming up in the late 90s and early 2000s, because yeah. it's all predictive programming. And they're shadowing the technology that's developed out of the projects in a way that enables people to 
process what is effectively uh, a very probable future. Yeah. So that's where we are on the AI thing. The AI thing, the vectors are as many as you can count right now because we're all interfacing with devices. We're interfacing with phones, computers. We're on the internet. We are surrounded by electromagnetic fields. We are surrounded by Wi-Fi. We have smart meters. We have 5G, 5G we coming need, we need online. To get- you know, Max, Max Egan's been talking a lot about 5G lately. I haven't had a chance to watch too many things, but I know he's been putting out some interesting stuff on that. We need to maybe have a conversation with him at some point. Um, but the 5G thing, like when I moved into the house I'm in now, like that, that's just the router that they put in our house. It's 5G. I don't know that it's enabled yet. Like, I don't know that it's a... That, that's, the rollout date is 2019 yeah. to 2020. Yeah. But that's, that's what they, they give us here. So people um, investigate, you know... Uh, yeah, you know, I have we have a, cert, a specific kind of stone sitting on top of that to try and mitigate some of the frequencies. But we need to start um, building defense <laughs> for this because it's you know yeah. Well, it, it will be so. This is actually the ubiquitous network that they've talked about. Mm-hmm. The uh, Internet of back, everything. And the internet yeah. everywhere, which goes back to studies that were done at MIT back in the seventies, yeah. where they were already then laying the infrastructure. A lot of people don't realize the internet was around in the 1960s. It's just, it wasn't public yet and it wasn't live the way we know it. Well, the internet it's, has actually always been around. It just wasn't a technological around. thing until, you know, the 1900s. It's, oh, it, and it is a um, knockoff of the true telepathic connection that exists between people and, and the way that that works. And um, they've convinced everybody that we need all of these and very successfully, might I might add, we need all of these devices and networks to be able to do what I think humans used to be able to do just automatically. Now. Which goes into the whole calcification of the third eye, the reason yeah. why they started to put the fluoride into the water, into the toothpaste, why they began to electrify everything. Because at one time, this is interesting, um, I had a discussion with a cousin of mine about what is my maternal grandfather who lived into his 90s, but he was deaf from the time he was in his early 30s. He went to dental school in Chicago. He had to leave, he came home, and the family it had sounded, this- It sounded like you said he went to devil school, but then dental I realized- Dental school, said, dental same school. Same thing, dental and then I realized you said dental but, school, and that's the same thing, yes. Right, right, <laughs> so he came back, and he, was, he, he went completely deaf. I mean, nerve deafness to the degree that yeah. no hearing aid would work. Yeah. But w- what evolved in the conversation was the fact that he was very empathic, but that despite the fact that he didn't hear, he understood things at a level that most people didn't. And that his biggest frustration in life was that most people couldn't pick up his communications because yeah. he communicated empathically. He had the most beautiful eyes, and when you looked into them, you could, you could see his soul. I mean, yeah. it was like that. And very few people ever got that because they couldn't get beyond the obvious that this man could not hear. Yeah. And see, we're all like that now. We're, we're third eye blind and third ear deaf. We have lost our capacity to empathically connect to things, mm-hmm. which makes it even more difficult for us what we do. We've never met in person that will be addressed at some soon. point, hopefully soon. Yeah. Because, you know, one of, one of the things that I would like to see, uh, this will happen. And I got a plane coming over, so just Of course, with I just me. had one too. <laughs> yeah, um, at least that's not the helicopter this time. So, <laughs> but, you know, eventually I am going to take a tour. I'm gonna take a year and I'm, we're, gonna, we're gonna go tour the country and maybe even outside of it to go and meet people and to talk in person. And I think to the degree possible, we need to begin to develop that, develop one-on-one. But the other thing that we're, we're gonna be forced to do this. You know, I said it as a joke years ago about doing radio shows telepathically. Yeah, I remember when you first started talking about that. I thought it was a great idea then. I think it's a great idea now. (laughs) I really think as we connect more, and this will be a process because again, we're dealing with a network and one of the things that's going to happen with the network is that certain machines are going to go bot on us and we're going to have to cut them off. That's what we're doing right now. 
Yeah. Yep. Some machines have gone rogue on us already. They've over overtaken the human hosts, and those machines need to be cut off. We need to terminate them. This is what the battle with AI is. You cannot fight AI at the level of a machine. The machine exists out there. The machine's way that it extends into you is through the nodes that it has extended into the human host. So the way we cut this off is we terminate the nodes because eventually the network will start to go dead. And the machine will sit there because the machine is dumb. It will generate more nodes somewhere else. We can't stop that. We can't change that. There are going to be two types of people. There are going to be the people who are able to cut off of this technology and cut away from the nodes that have embedded itself in them and are sentient, human, organic, breathing, feeling souls and spirits, and there are going to be those who simply go into the robotic mode. They will be machine-like. They will be the insectoids. They will be the mantids. They will be the flies, the spiders, and they will go about their life robotically, and the two worlds will not be able to exist with each other. I don't know exactly how all this works, yeah. but I do know that we are in the period, the formative period of this now, which takes us into this eclipse. And what I've been seeing with this eclipse, I'm very concerned about it. I'm more concerned about what is being done with the energies than the energies themselves. Mm -hmm. The energy is yeah. neutral. But what has happened in the last week, and I, and I said this in a, in a post again on Facebook, um, I said, you know, people are going to gather, they're going to party, they're going to drink. They're going to do drugs. They're going to have sex. They're going to have children. People are going to get married. They're going to do all kinds of things, consecrating this energy that is being brought in by this event, which, as far as I'm concerned, is all artificial. Yeah. There's nothing natural about any of this anymore, if there ever was. And this is the hardest part to get to in explaining the construct is what is it that we live on? I mean, almost everybody now who has plugged in in some way is, ch is challenging their dominant perception of the reality stream. You call it the matrix, you call it the construct, you can call it uh, whatever you want to call it, but the sense is out there, especially people who have been around long enough to watch what's happened to see our sun swapped out, to see the complete fabrication of this, this thing called the moon, <laughs> which, is, which is, you know, Cliff Heiss talked about this extensively, and, 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 and he's right. This, this, thing's, this thing's artificial. This thing was not created as a natural force of these supposedly alleged floating orb spheroid satellite thing yeah. satellite things spinning around us spinning around the solar system and all of these you know the, the whole copernican system is in question now yep and i think this is healthy i i don't think it's healthy to fixate on the format right now but i think we can get to that i think the flat earth people are frankly obsessive they're they're close to write about some things and then they just go Again, the cheese slides off the cracker. But I th well, I think I think I think there's people on both sides. There's flat Earth people that are obsessive, yes. and there's ball Earth or round Earth or circle Earth yeah. or whatever people that are obsessive. And I I love um, what Greg Carlwood says, and I'm with him on this. I, he's Earth shape agnostic, and so am I. And I don't, you know, I, uh, the way Pretty I much. think of it. Yeah. I, and we've talked about this before. This is a realm. We're in a realm, and a realm doesn't necessarily have the same structure or form all of the time. So I'm not even convinced we're dealing with something that is always in the same form, um, you know, but yeah, like, uh, you know, there's many things that, are, there are many positives about people who are questioning shape of, people who question everything, who question the shape of the earth. But when it becomes a religion, we have a problem. And I'd say that there are religious zealots on both sides of that argument. Yeah. So, um, one of the, you know, this one of the, I've been posting on this quite a bit lately, and I, this, some of this is based on concepts that I've developed because I have viewed it 
and there's other people that have viewed it as well. Uh, some people in our groups and some other people that I talk to as well that have uh, been able to travel outside and look at the construct in a way that I don't think even is afforded by space travel because, well, what, what, are, what are they, you know, we're shooting rockets off to where exactly? Because like I've said, our bodies are oriented towards vertical up and down dimensions that don't really work out real well once you understand the structure of the reality stream itself. It's just, you know, what we have conceived as space simply doesn't work anymore. And it's like you said, rather than getting into the whole, is it flat, is it round? We need to look at it more realistically in terms of how it functions relative to our perceptual ability, our consciousness. Yep. So, you know, I'll, I'll screen share this because it's a great um, resource for people that want to look at this that maybe haven't seen the, uh, the Facebook page. Let me pull this up and you'll see this is a Facebook post I put out on Sunday and this the Carriott St. Louis sent sent me uh, information about Giulia Gioiana Conforto she's an Italian writer who writes dominantly in German I'm not sure how that works but her writing seemed to be in German for the most part and but she does have a website where there's a lot of english articles and one of them is the the platonic cave refound and she was actually when i read this article i i was like i went oh my god this so echoes what i believe when she says my thesis are the effects of personal and collective inner visions as i wrote in my latest book baby son revelation the interstellar space does not exist at all and so when we talk about interstellar space, we're talking about the NASA version of outer space. And we're talking about the orb models and the sun as the center and we spin around it. We have to deconstruct all of that. When, once we start to understand the artificial nature of this, then we can understand the energies that are also being generated through it, which brings us back to the eclipse and where I want to kind of wrap this up tonight. because. What I don't want people to do is to take our word for it. I think you need to trust your own intuition. Yep. But what is coming in this eclipse in one sense is kind of a test of discernment of what you do with it. If you are going to go observe it, I plan to stop during the time of the eclipse. It's going to occur, what, Monday morning sometime, early morning, I feel, like I'm not, I feel like I'm not going to look. I'm, but I, I'm not I'm planning. Not. Well, it's going to get fairly dark here. I think we may get to 75, maybe a little bit more dark, which is close to a full eclipse. And it's as close as we've seen a full eclipse on the East Coast in my lifetime, I think. I remember I, one eclipse. I, I feel like I'm probably not going to look. Like I'm going to stay inside and... But yes, that I'm going to just try and be try and be as still and quiet during that period of time as I can be. Exactly, exactly, and that's the point of this. I mean, there was a part of me that went, "Gosh, I'd like to do a show during that time, but it's not possible. It's not I'm doing live streaming." Plus, here's the thing: we all need to process what's going on around us in individual ways. But there is a dark energetic side to this. There are a lot of people on both sides of what they perceive to be the light and the dark, the light workers and the dark side workers that are going to try and harness this energy. There's a yep. group that are, are going up to Mount Shasta. They're going to do a mass meditation at 1111 when 82117. Break those numbers down. There's a shitload of 11s in there. Yeah. And let's not forget that 11 is one of those numbers that shows up in events pretty consistently. I mean, let's start yeah. with 9-11, 3-11, 7-11. We've had events that have triggered off as a result of, of 11 numbers. It doesn't mean the there's numbers 11, bad. There's, there's 11 in the, coming up in the Charlottesville event, including the word Charlottesville has the two L's in it. So that's mm -hmm. like an 11. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've been paying too much attention to the Charlottesville thing. It's impossible to avoid it completely. 
um, Robert has done shows both yesterday and today where he talked about it. And I think yes. he's, uh, I, I actually tried to call him tonight because I wanted, uh, he brought up some interesting things that I had some thoughts about. Um, you know, today he was basically, I, I think what we're dealing with here is a, a classic case of uh, both sides. This whole thing is totally staged and it, the both sides. It's totally funded, staged. Both sides being funded by the same people. The person who organized the Unite the Right event was also part of organizing Occupy Wall Street, according to Robert. I haven't had time to check into this, but Robert's usually pretty good with his research. And the other third element of this that not that many people know about is, uh, and he talked about this in his show yesterday, Henrik Palmgren from Red Ice Radio had his website totally taken shut out. Down. Yep. Totally taken out Both right sites. before this. And this, the part, and this is, you know, a lot of people hate on Henrik. And he certainly has done some things over the last couple of years that I don't understand, but I had developed such a liking and respect for him for all the work he did in the years before that I have been, I really am trying to understand him and where he's coming from. And so I do still pay attention to what he does, but it, I, the thought dawned on me that, you know, he, with his background and understanding conspiracy and understanding geopolitics, and he was going there planning to live stream it he would be the one person that if he saw just the right combination of weird things going on would recognize even to the level of realizing maybe that he had been duped into something that he, had, he, he he's the guy like you know he, he distracting him during this event it was all it was about taking out his website and preventing him from live streaming and all that kind of shit but mostly it was about distracting his attention during this event because this is a guy who knows a lot about a lot of stuff. And there was a lot of different things going down at the same time at that place. And he might've been the one guy who'd have been able to pick up on all of them. And he was distracted with this website takedown during this event. Well, the, the polarization is, is engineered. The, the, yeah. the buzzwords yep. here are Nazis. Right. You know, but yeah. nobody ever talks about the Zionists that sit in the background and engineer all this stuff. Well, and also stuff. the anti-fascists that act like fascists. Well, yeah, yeah, <laughs> the, yeah, the interfas, which, you know, what is that? These are abstractions. Yeah. You know, you, you blend in David, David Duke and the KKK. Well, they, 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 first off, it's a myth that you can reinvigorate the right. I mean, I don't know what right and left is and I don't care anymore. Right. We've talked about this. This isn't my system. I don't give a flying flip about, about it at We all. are completely out of it. Yeah, I, I'm, I am not right. I am not left. I don't care. I think government is a religion. I think it's all bullshit. You know what I mean? Like, I don't think there's... Well, I, I mean, so here's the thing. That what you fight against, you feed energy to. Yeah. I just what are we fighting think... against? The stratification of a culture based on racial stereotypes and this uber paranoia about things like Nazis and white fascism, uh, which goes back to Henrik. It's very instructive because Henrik basically got, he basically got hated on by the, the certain aspects of the truth community or the research community in particular, because he dared to speak words that most people won't say. Yeah, and yeah. it went into the greatest story never told, which was this documentary about Adolf Hitler, that is entirely factual. It's very unpleasant to watch. It doesn't vindicate Hitler, but what it does, it shows you the extreme reactionism that chained all of these events off, both before the war, during it, and after it. And, and we've been mirroring this process for decades now, entire generations, in terms of the reactionism against the Holocaust as it was alleged to have happened, the oppression of the Jews versus the power of the Jews versus the rise of Islam, which is perceived as a, as a religion of color, and the reaction of specifically white European males in response to seeing what has happened to their cultures as a result of being flooded with people who come from another ethnic and religious and cultural background. And in, yeah. and in effect, what's happened is all of these have been collided. It's, it's, it's like when we were kids, boys do this. You take toy trucks and you would slam them together because you want to see what they're going to do. Yep. 
Well, that's what they've been doing socially with us. They've socially engineered us by simply continuing to collide opposing forces against each other in the interest of restructuring the culture and moving us in a different direction and of stratifying us against people that we're not, I'm not anti-Muslim, I'm not anti-Black, I'm not anti-Jew, I'm not anti-gay, and yet all of these factions have been flung against us in ways that have caused us to kind of rise up in a reactionary storm against them because they become extreme. And so you take Henrik Palmgren, he responded to what was happening to his culture of watching yeah, his- I have to remember that he's Swedish and Sweden yeah. has been the country that received the poop end of this first and strongest. And so I actually have a lot of compassion for him because he's literally watching the destruction yeah. and downfall of his, of his country and his culture. And, and it's been very extreme there. And so none of us know what that's like. And like I said, I don't, you know, I would actually, you know, I probably would receive so much hate from this from family and friends and whatever, but I would love to speak with him at some point, um, you know, have a conversation with him. I, I've been really reserving any form of judgment or, and, and I've actually been, extent, you know, just trying to have compassion for, and under, trying to understand where he's, you know, come from and what he's been doing for the last couple of years. You know, sometimes I can listen to some of it and I think he has some points that are, they, he and some of his guests have some points that are very fair and other things just, it, it makes me want to cringe. Not so much things that he says, but some things that some of his guests have said. But there's a part of me that, you know, I watched a video of him describe, explaining what had happened to him the other day. There's still a very smart, loving, caring person oh, yeah, in there. Yeah who has done a tremendous amount of wonderful work that we have all learned from and appreciate. And I'm just, I lean so much more towards trying to understand where he's coming from than to just go, Oh, well, I don't get what he's doing. So let's get, let's, you know, let's, let's throw him under the bus or whatever. Um, well, this, you know. this community is notorious yeah. for eating its own. Eating yeah, because, totally. because, because it doesn't, it wants a homogeneity that's not there. There are people who yeah. want me or you to say certain things that we're not going to say anymore or, or because we shift positions on things. Yep. It's a very fluid process. I, I have people who've said, I, I won't listen to your show anymore. You had this person on, you had this guest, you said this, you said that. And I'm like, I'm okay. fine with that. Yeah. My Skype's blowing up. Anyway. So <laughs> that's in support of, I can't do anything. That's in support of Henrik. Uh, and, and it's to say that let's remove our energy from this divide and conquer strategy. Yeah. I don't see much use in going to protests. Nope. You know, I know some of the militia people from Pennsylvania went down there. I believe they went with good intent. But the rally was basically to solidify the right. I don't well, know what you thing, think you're I'm solidifying sorry. at this point. The other thing that was interesting that Robert was talking about and that um, I heard, uh, um, some, was it Robert talking about, I was listening to someone else talk about this too. And one of the interesting things was that um, the, if you look into the stuff that went on in the Ukraine, yeah. where they were, our, our, our government was, with our tax dollars, were funding and supporting actual neo-Nazis neo that were actually involved you know, in uh, the Auschwitz and all of that kind of, you know, all the stuff, the killing Poles and killing Jews and whatever, like our government was funding that. And then here it's like, you know, they're like, oh, these people are Nazis. But it would be interesting and it wouldn't surprise me if the same groups are funding this protest that funded that protest because both were chanting the thing about the blood and soil. I forget the name of the group it's the, the, in the Ukraine, but it, they were part of the Maidan protests. Um, this whole thing is very, this all stinks. I mean, literally, like, and it was George Soros's birthday that day. Like, literally, if, if we could be entirely looking at a situation where George Soros funded both sides of this and also funded the takedown of Red Ice Radio, and this whole thing was just, you know, I mean, was just a, 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 like a complete and total staged psyop that, that was, you know, I mean, even all of these wars that we're always involved in, usually both sides are being funded by the same people. You know what I mean? Like we have to stop this. Like we have to stop, we, we should all even like, like we're talking about it right now because 
we're trying to point something out, but like literally, like when this stuff, people work were asking me, what do you think was going on in Charlottesville? And all I can say is, I don't, it's not, this is not real. This is not what happens generally organically with normal people without there being some sort of guiding or outside influence. This is not, this is like laboratory test tube shit. No, the, well, protest is dead. There's no point in it. The, yeah, the only protest. thing we can do, I, and I said this today in the post, we have to let this thing die. And then we have to find a soft landing and we have to find a way to organize ourselves around human principles and yeah. stop fighting with each other over things that don't matter, like race, religion, color, creed, sexuality, and all of these other things. It doesn't that divide matter us. at all. Yeah. It doesn't. You know, it, the things that matter are the things that are predatory, and we have that in common as a race of people, and we need to muster ourselves around it. It goes yep. back to the AI thing again. Yeah. Yep. Whatever you consider AI to be, it has been here from the beginning. We descended yeah. as light beings into a world of chaos governed by forces of artificial intelligence. And so yeah. to, to wrap this up, to, to kind of put a bow on it, what do you do? Well, we, we talked a little bit about diet. We talked a little bit about how to clean up your body. This is a good time to do it. It may be that this eclipse is your time to do a fast or to do a cleanse or to do something positive for your body, to disengage from social media, disengage from the electronics, pull away the things you can do. You can, there are the, there are the four elements, air, water, earth, and fire. I know of one person today, a dear friend of Emily's and I, who used fire as a purge, as a way to cleanse himself of an AI infection. You ground, you breathe, you drink pure water, and you engage with the natural world that you have around you. And I can't stress water and breathing enough. If nothing else, the bare minimum, do very deliberate breathing. Just take some time to do that. Get quiet. Whatever energies are gonna come in, shield yourself. Don't let yourself open to the energies. You can observe, I plan to observe the eclipse simply by noting whatever changes are shown to me as this thing occurs, which may be psychic mental energies as well as the natural vista around me when this thing happens. Am I celebrating it? No. Why would I celebrate something that I consider to be an artificiality? Yeah. You got anything you wanna say closing out? No, just... um. Yeah, you know, guys, like, uh, we need to be careful and take care of one another and um, yeah, be compassionate, but also be smart. And um, I say it again, I said it in the last show with Ron Lauda, I think this is a really, really important time to take really good care of your body. It is. It, it clean is. up your diet, get yourself in really good physical condition because you're going to need stamina. This is going to, I think that whatever we're in for, is not this doom and gloom thing that people keep saying, but it's gonna require a lot of stamina and, the, and a lot of um, physical and emotional wherewithal and um, the ability to you know, constantly be um, you know, uh, your own energy source. You know what I mean? Like I think this is part of this, we have to, you know, um, Stop letting things be parasites on us. And, you know, we have to all take responsibility for our own production and consumption of energy. Um, and and um, uh, that's it. Um, you know, uh, eat well, sleep well. It's hard to sleep well sometimes. Exercise. Um, and, you know, I love this thing we do you know, where we talk about all these, con you know, interesting concepts and metaphysical ideas and spiritual things and whatnot, we also need to be really, really grounded and really pay attention to all the things that are going on in the reality around us. And, um, you know, uh, this really matters. Um, and, uh, yeah, and, and um, 
also be kind to ourselves because as you know, even though we are all getting better at better and improving our discernment, still think, you know, it's not even slip ups, like, you know, the, the things that are trying to penetrate become more sophisticated. And so when, you know, you've made a mistake, and then I don't want to say, call it made a mistake, but when, you know, something has happened that, you know, you're like, oh, I should have had better discernment there. Don't punish yourself over it. The less the experience is valuable and you're smarter yeah. and sharp, sharpen your, it's sharp. It's sharp don't beat yourself you. up. Don't beat yourself up over it. Just, uh, you know, appreciate what the experience was, learn from it. Like that's one of the, and, and, uh, and move forward. And sometimes, and also we have to, um, sometimes the things or the people that provide that are part of the unpleasant experience, we also have to hold a space to sometimes, you know, um, uh, forgive them and let, and you know, we have to still, we were talking about a little bit, and this isn't about forgiveness, but we were talking about not throwing people, you know, under the bus when we were talking about Henrik, sometimes people get overcome with something and they be, behave in ways that are, um, that are, the reactions uh, to extreme situations and the reactions yeah. themselves are extreme. Yeah. You know, yeah. and sometimes, you know, you know, these, uh, these kinds of AI infections are no joke. And sometimes they overtake someone. And, uh, you know, if that person can at some point recognize what's happened and, you know, cleanse themselves and make the correction, we also have to start being more compassionate about helping people have a yeah. way back to yeah. the group. We can't just keep throwing people away because they did something we didn't like, or they made a mistake or an error in judgment, or they became carried away with themselves or whatever. Like we need to all start being brutally honest with ourselves and each other, and, but we need to do it in a way that is helpful and compassionate and that we can all learn from. Exactly. That is all very true. Yeah. Um, so this is the show that will go out before the eclipse. It is the pre-clip show. And, uh, you know, somewhere in all of this, there's probably something that was there for you. And as I always like to say, chew hard, spit out the bones and keep the things that matter. And until the next time we get together, um, the truth is out there, but it's really down inside of you. And that's the place where you have to keep looking. We'll be back again very soon.